So even when I did start with Bill, he was preaching about walking the desert for me to hear this one year. It doesn't matter if half Christ in the heart. That's right. It's three hours. And he's like, you're watching later. So I help you spread the Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. And it's good Thank having you here in our service. And so thankful that you could be here with us today. Uh, we got a lot of things going on here this morning. And so uh, I've got a couple announcements. But we are going to have, we have some gifts for all the mothers here in the service today. Uh, we actually have three things. We've got, we're going to do a drawing here in just a few minutes for the flowers. Now, once you... Uh, Pick the flyer that you want. If your ticket is called and you pick the flyer you want, you can leave them up here if you'd like to until after the service. You don't have to take it back and hold it in your lap. So uh, a couple of those would be a little awkward. And uh, But anyway, we do have a couple gifts, and this is for all the mothers. We have a uh, white carnation in the back that we're giving out to all the mothers. And uh, I guess if you've ever experimented with those before, you can put some food coloring in water, and it'll go up through the leaves. and. Uh, but we're going to keep the stems on them long so you can trim them to whatever uh, size you want. And then, let's see, here's the other gift we have. Uh, we have these in some gift boxes. These are little notepads. I know a lot of times ladies uh, like to have uh, little things they can make, grocery lists and things on. But it's got the church name and address on it and also a pen that goes along with it. Now, these are blue because we have three colors to choose from. We did not have any ladies colors. The yellow collar uh, was a really, 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 really odd looking yellow. So uh, we had, I think it was white and blue were the other selections. So I thought, well, uh, blue is kind of what, you know, a lot of things in our church are. So we're just going to go ahead and get blue and uh, do that. But I think you'll enjoy these, uh, these little books. But we do have the carnation in the books for all the mothers. And then uh, we'll do the drawing here in just a few minutes. Now, let me say this. If you came into our service and uh, you did not get a ticket, uh, we want to make sure everybody gets a ticket. Uh, so let me go ahead and ask anybody not get a ticket when they came in? We try to make sure any mother not get a ticket. <laughs> All the boys? I missed it. So. Any mothers not get a ticket? And these are not mud or modern day type mothers. These are old fashioned type mothers. Uh, ladies is what I'm talking about. So, um, anyway, uh, a couple of announcements I want to let you know about. Also, uh, we are going to have a baptismal service here after the preaching service is done. Uh, we have four young men that's going to get baptized. I'm excited for that. Uh, two of the Thomas boys and also two. Uh, the Spencer boys are going to get baptized, and so we're looking forward uh, to that time. And uh, and let's see here. Um, there are several announcements. I'm not going to go through them all because they're in your bulletin, but don't forget this week, uh, Kelsey Gillespie, is, her shower is on May 14th. That's at 2 p.m., and she's registered at Amazon and Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, and then uh, if you would be praying about uh, our nursery, uh, we have a lot of babies coming uh, this year, and I was walking back through the nursery, and I think if I counted correctly, we have one bed. Uh, we're going to need to do something uh, about the beds, and uh, so I'll need some of you mothers. Uh, now, guys, you can help out with this too, but guys think more practical. Uh, I'm thinking of ways we can stack beds and get them going across and uh, we can shove one in here and one in there and, and uh, guys think more that way I think but uh, you ladies as far as you know, we want to definitely consider safety uh, and all that stuff but we need to consider the space that we have but we're probably going to need to get some more beds or do something uh, to have some more space because there we have some young people already nursery age but then there's uh, some more coming along and uh, so that's a good problem to have but uh, if you could be praying about that and maybe get some ideas and then let me know, and uh, we'll see what we can do with that. Uh, also, I did want to let you know, some of you have asked about the, uh, the grounds down here, when they were going to start that. Uh, they've gotten all the uh, utility, I guess, people in line and uh, where they had everything marked that needed to be marked. Uh, he said this week is the week. They're planning. It's supposed to be good all week, so uh, they're going to see how wet it is. 
Uh, they might not be able to start tomorrow, but they're hoping to get started by Tuesday. And uh, we'll just see how long it goes from there. But they said it can get done. <coughs> and their goal is to get us grass uh, before coal wars. So that's the goal anyway. But anyway, I just wanted to let you know, give you an update on that. Now, we do also, coming up here in a couple of weeks, we have uh, graduation Sunday. And there is uh, a list here in the bulletin of our graduates, uh, our high school graduates. We have three of those, uh, Nathaniel, Bonnell, Scott Offenberger, Cameron Thomas, and then also <coughs> Lee, uh, who graduated there with his uh, machinist certification, his associates, uh, and he'll begin work soon. And then Kelly Ellison, she uh, double majored uh, with her bachelor's in psychology and also in sociology. And uh, she's starting work on her master's degree and social work, and she will be also starting, I think she said this fall, uh, working at the Child Advocacy Center in Mercer County. So uh, I'm excited for them. That's a tremendous accomplishment, and uh, glad that they uh, made it through. Now, I haven't talked to the high school graduates yet to see what their further plans are, uh, but I'll try to get you that information as well. Um, and then uh, Brother Dale Cable will be speaking here uh, he's going to be reporting from the mission field on Sunday evening uh, in that service, and that will be May 22nd. And, uh, and then also you see a note in there about the Christmas joy bags. We're collecting uh, stuffed animals, uh, small stuffed animals, and then I should clarify that small stuffed animals. They need to go in a bag. So <laughs> uh, Elizabeth had a few stuffed animals, I think. Maybe me and Maya inherited them somehow, but these things were like, Humongous. Uh, <clears throat> don't know why they would even make things like that. But anyway, um, and they're still in storage, I think. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, some all stuffed animals, and then boys and girls uh, body wash. And those are the large body washes. So that's what we're collecting for this month. And then there's also an announcement in the bulletin for uh, Kelsey Gillespie and Caleb Spencer's wedding. That is June fourth at 11 a.m. and so that's coming up here just a few weeks away. Now there is a sign-up sheet in the vestibule. Uh, if you're planning to attend, we need to try to get an accurate number. They're wanting to have it outside, so we just need to make sure we have enough things set up there uh, for that. Uh, and then be in prayer for Cold Wars. Cold Wars is the week right after that. We have our men's prayer breakfast uh, on Saturday the 11th. Uh, so that'll be the Saturday before. That'll be at 8 a.m. and uh, so we got a lot of things happening here within the next uh, couple months. Usually this is our busy time of year once we hit March all the way through June, and then we get a little break maybe after the camps in July. Uh, we get a month or two, and then uh, usually we'll have some other things going on as we get ready for fall and get into uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday time. So anyway, that's all the announcements I have right now. So let's all stand. Let's welcome one another to our service, and then we'll prepare for our Sunday morning Steve, <laughs> the offer, please. 
Our Father, we come before you again. Thank you so much for this wonderful day you've given us. Our Father, thank you for the mothers. Our Father, not only our mothers, but all those mothers out there. Our Father, we just know that there's so many godly mothers out there, our Father, and that they they raise the children to to look to you, our Father, for all their answers. Our Father, we just ask that you'll be with this service, our Father, that you'll give preacher walk the words that we need to hear, and everyone came expecting a blessing, our Father. And we just ask that you'll allow us to use this offering to uplift in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Maybe see
the difference between holding that book and looking at them on your phone. Yeah. There's yeah. something about holding that Bible in your hand and reading it. Let's turn number 236. Let's stand and sing Amazing Grace 236. has a couple different kinds. It's got yellow and then uh, it's kind of a reddish, orangish purple on the end. Uh, a light purple flower. <laughs> and there's probably more scientific names you give those. And uh, this is a nice little red one here. <laughs> and we got the pink. Yeah, they all have green too. I forgot to say that. <laughs> this is always a pretty one. I like this one. They had a couple of different ones of those, but I think that's the first year we've got dark purple in the main flower. So anyway, what we're going to do is just number those one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, if you want to see them again, you can let me know, or you can just tell me your number, uh, however you want to do it. If you want to come up and uh, kind of look at it a little more closely, you can do that. But here we go. Make sure I can read this. One year I read the numbers upside down and nobody came forward. <laughs> What's a weird number? Zero, zero, zero. 
Is that Jenny? All right. <laughs> <laughs> the Ridge Raymond. That's number four. Uh, number four. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the callers don't even help sometimes. All right. Let's get another one here. Zero, zero, three. All right, Vicki. Six. One number six, the one on the very end. Last one. All right. Let's get another one here. Zero, one, six. Christy. The third one over? Okay. And I appreciate you ladies helping with the numbers. So. All right, and let's get another one here. Nine, nine, I think. Yeah, nine, nine, nine. Make sure I wasn't six, six, six. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the first two, these two here, and then the fifth one, which is the pink one out here. You may hold it up for you. <laughs> this is. I'll take that one. That one. Okay. All right, so we're down to the yellow, different color one, and the pink one. All right, let's see here. Somebody wrote something on that. Zero, zero, nine. Zero, zero, nine. Okay, good. Well, that's a good one. The pink one. Is that right? Yeah. Number five, yes. All right. And one last one here. Nine, nine, two. All right, great. And you get the other one here. So number two, all right. Well, great, thank you ladies so very much. And don't forget all the mothers, we have uh, two gifts for you. We have the little notebook. Uh, we'll give those to you on the way out the door. Now, if you go out this way, um, maybe one of our men uh, can bring a few of those, a few carnations uh, for the ones that go out this door uh, and the, the gift boxes whenever we get ready to in the service here. So that way everybody can have one. Um, and again, we're going to have a baptismal here in just a few minutes. But right now, I think we have a special. Do you have a special CA? Okay, so come on up and sing your special. My mother's already passed and gone, but I do want to pay tribute to her. She is very wonderful woman. I'm so thankful and blessed to have been raised in a Christian home. It really makes a lot of difference. I know there's a lot of people that don't have that privilege and blessing of being raised in a Christian home. It makes things hard in life. To raise up a child in the way it should go and when it's older you not be part. In my own opinion, I had the best mother in the world. That's a little bit of prejudice on my side, but you should feel the same way about your mother. Right. This is a song, it's a story of a person that didn't get saved until after their mother passed away. Angels, please bear this message. <laughs> That I have been saved by marvelous grace. But there's one thing that I'm asking when you reach that heavenly place. Would you call out my name loud? Somewhere 
up in heaven, Mama's listening to hear. Oh, she must have prayed a million prayers and cried a million tears. So when you write my name in heaven, call out my name loud and clear. And I remember when at her bedside, the last words I heard her say was, Oh Lord, please save my children. Then to heaven she slipped away. And Jesus, angels, would you do one thing for me? Would you call out my name? Somewhere up in heaven, Mama's listening to hear. Oh, she must have prayed a million prayers and cried a million tears. So when you write my name in heaven, call out my name loud and clear. Amen. Amen. So thankful for mothers that pray for their children. And if you have a mother like that, or had a mother like that, yeah, she's worth her weight in gold for sure. Well, take your Bibles and turn with you to the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. This is going to kind of be a jumping off point here, if you would. And then you also want to find 1 Samuel chapter 1. Proverbs 31 and then 1 Samuel chapter 1. As C.A. was singing, uh, I was reminded of uh, a, a story back when I first started going to church. And I had just started preaching and uh a young man I was talking to, he was in his early 20s, and I was asking him if he was saved, and of course he knew he wasn't saved. Uh, I invited him to the church, and he said, yeah, I think I might might come you know, hear you sometime. And, and as we talked about his spiritual condition, he goes, well, he said, I know it's just a matter of time before I get saved, because my mom's been praying for me. She's been praying for me, been praying for me faithfully. She's done it for years. And uh, basically what he told me was he wanted to enjoy himself before he got saved. And uh, the weekend, that Sunday night that I preached, I was expecting him to come. He didn't show up. Instead, he chose to go to a party. And uh, they did not find him for a couple of days, but he died on the way home uh, in a car wreck. And uh, I was thinking about his mother and all those prayers. You know, don't take those prayers for granted. You don't take for granted the opportunities that God gives you, uh, first of all, to get saved, and then don't take for granted the opportunities God gives you to make things right. Uh, maybe you've been saved, but you've kind of drifted away from the Lord, and, and uh, you know people are praying for us. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is praying for us, and uh, so I'm thankful for that. But Proverbs chapter 31, we're going to start here in verse number 10. This is a tremendous, tremendous portion of scripture here. And uh, boy, I tell you what, this type of woman, this virtuous woman that we are going to be looking at here, uh, this type of person is very rare, as we will see uh, from verse 10. It says, who can find a virtuous woman for her price as far above rubies? Now, this makes a good poetical phrase. Uh, you know, as you read that verse, but when you think about the price being far above rubies, the most precious gem that <laughs> is found on earth is a ruby. It's the rarest of gems. Uh, now, diamonds are often more expensive because diamonds match everything. Rubies match things that are red and stuff like that. Uh, but rubies are actually the most precious gem and the rarest to find 
for her. So that's the comparison that God is making here to a virtuous woman. It says, who can find a virtuous woman for a price as far above rubies? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Now from verse 13 all the way down through verse 26, we see a tremendous description here of a virtuous woman. I'm not going to preach necessarily on the virtuous woman here this morning, but look at verse 27 if you would. It says, She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. Now that word favor there means to be liked. Every, I think every woman wants to be liked and, and wants to feel like they're attractive. I think that's a natural thing that God uh, you know, puts in them and they want to make themselves attractive. And that is not a bad thing. But favor is deceitful. Some women, that's all they have in their entire life because they have no virtue. They spend thousands and thousands of dollar, dollars uh, you know, trying to make themselves uh, look better. They get older. They try to buy to every step of the way, and that's okay. But the main thing that every, not just woman, as we'll find out here in a minute, but every man ought to have is virtue. We ought to all strive for virtue. And it says, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. That means it's empty. It's going to go away at some time. It's nice, you young men, you find a, a good-looking young lady uh, one day to marry. Uh, well, you better make sure she has more than looks. She should have looks, yes. I remember my grandma told me a long time ago, there was, I was probably, goodness, fifth grade, sixth grade, and I visited her little country church there in Salem, West Virginia. It was up some holler, and uh, there were three of us in the Sunday school class, and one, it was all the kids in the church, and uh, there was one girl in there. She was probably fourth grade. And uh, I was there one time, and my grandma, every time I went back, said, you know, that girl still has that picture you drew, and she's still waiting for you to come back to church. And, and, uh, and I just, you know, trying to be as nice as I can, but she was just as ugly as sin. Just <laughs> I mean, I just know that's terrible to say, but I was not attracted to her. And my grandma preached to me and preached to me and preached to me, and she goes, well, looks aren't everything. And I know that. But I'd say, Grandma, I still have to look at her. <laughs> now I'm here to tell you, young men, you had better find someone who is not just beautiful on the outside to you, but they better be beautiful on the inside. Amen. Because really, that's what you're going to be looking at as the years go on. Right. It says, favors the sequel and beauty is vain, but a woman <coughs> that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures. I pray, Lord, that you will bless our service here this morning. I pray that, Lord, I'm excited about the baptism we'll have here in a little bit for these four young men who have professed Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, uh, Lord, as they follow this first step of obedience and obeying you, Lord, I pray that you bless them. But, Lord, as we celebrate here Mother's Day and we think about uh, our mothers, we think about those uh, who are mothers, and I'm thankful for the godly mothers we have here in our church and the godly examples they are to the young children we have. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you will speak to everyone, not just the mothers, but Lord, to all of us. Because this thing about virtue is very, very important to you, so therefore it ought to be important to us. And Lord, more importantly, I pray that there be one in our service here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, that today would be the day they get to settle once and for all. What a tremendous uh, time to get saved on Mother's Day. And uh, Father, I pray that you will bless all these things now. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. Well, this whole entire chapter here is centered around this rare woman who can find this virtuous woman. It tells us of her value, her price is far above rubies. It tells us of her virtues, as I mentioned, from verse 13 all the way down through verse 26. And then it proclaims her victories at the end of the chapter about uh, her husband praiseth her and, and uh, her children rise up and call her blessed. These are her victories. And if you're going to have a victory, and I know we have some career ladies in here, and, and that's okay, but your greatest victory is not your career. 
Your greatest victory is when your children can arise up and call you blessed and your husband praiseth you. And those are tremendous victories. Now, the Bible talks about, even in, uh, it's in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1, there are some things we are all, everyone, man, woman, and young person, we are all to add to our faith. The first thing we're to add is virtue. Now, I'm not preaching necessarily on the virtuous woman. I've just entitled the message, The Making of a Virtuous Woman. How does a virtuous woman become virtuous? But I would like to apply this to all of us. How do we become virtuous? How do we have virtue? How do we get this virtue? And I think we can see this being achieved through the life of Hannah. And I'm not going to, uh, if you turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 1, I'm not going to go too much into depth on this. I just want to kind of hit some highlights here about some things that she had in her life that made her virtuous. Uh, there were some other ladies throughout the Bible that we could have uh, could have looked at here this morning. But Hannah is a good one. We've uh, just covered uh, her story in her Samuel in Sunday school class. We covered it here about uh, two months ago. And uh, so it should be a little bit fresh in your mind if you were in the Sunday school classes. So how do we become virtuous? Well, first of all, uh, as we go through this story, I want you to uh, draw your attention here to verse 9. Now, just to give you a background of the story, in case you're not familiar with it, uh, Hannah was one of two wives, and her husband, uh, he loved both of these women, but, and of course that was not right for him to have two wives. There were many people in the Old Testament that had more than one wife. That's not the way God made it from the beginning. That was not his intention. It was one man to be with one woman for life. That was always his intention. Now, we live in a society today where people have multiple spouses not at the same time, but sometimes because of divorce, sometimes because of other things that come up. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you have a spouse now, that is the one God intends for you to stay with. He intends for you to keep those vows. He intends for you to be honorable in that. But Hannah was one of two wives, and, and her husband loved her, but she was barren. And she was barren from the Lord. Uh, you know, some women are not able to have children. And, you know, I think that's a... I, that's obviously a sad thing, but it's from God. God has a purpose for it. And oftentimes, <laughs> those women are the most compassionate women. Uh, those women oftentimes uh, are the most thoughtful, the most caring women uh, when it comes to looking at other people's needs. And I've just noticed that in uh, different folks that I've run into over the years. i uh, seen that to be true. And it's just something I think, something extra God puts in them because of that. But here was a woman who was barren and did not have any children. But the first thing I think it's important for us to see that she had in her life, if we want to have virtue in our life, and that's every man, woman, and child, if we want to have virtue in our life, it's got to start with a personal relationship with the Lord. Amen. Verse number 9 says, So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh. Now they had gone to Shiloh for the sacrifice. That's what they did faithfully. Every year they did this. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. You know, Hannah was oftentimes like you and I. When we get in a time of distress, what do we do? We pray, don't we? We cry out to God. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. God knows the distress that we're in at the time. There's... And there's no reason we should not uh, take it to him anyway. He says, you have not because you ask not. We ought to go to him in our distress. But you know, this was the one time that we find Hannah was in bitterness of soul. We don't know that she was like that every year she went. She went consistently. She had a personal relationship with the Lord. And a lot of people, uh, this is where it's got to start. If you're going to have virtue in your life. You have to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. You have to know him. Now, we preach a lot here in the church about having a no-so salvation. There are some people who have a say-so salvation. Yes, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. But in Matthew, the book of Matthew, it tells us there uh, that Jesus says, Many will say to me in that day, Have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? And he's going to say those Probably the saddest words ever written in the scripture. Right. 
Yeah. Depart from me, for I never knew you. There's a lot of people who have a say-so salvation. And this is why it's so very important for us to allow the Lord to examine our hearts. Because there's nothing worth us being deceived. Hell is real. Eternity is forever. And we don't want to go to that place. So we ought to constantly examine ourselves. So don't have just a say-so salvation because it's not going to get you to heaven. You ought to have a no-so salvation. The Bible says these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. But you know, I'm going to say this as a pastor. It goes even deeper than that. We have preached for years about knowing for sure you're saved. We ought to have a no-so salvation. But let me say this. The Bible teaches this. You ought to also have a show-so salvation. Yeah. 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 You have no reason to be confident and have a no-so salvation if you have no show-so salvation. We ought to be living the life. Matter of fact, uh, we're going through a Bible study on Wednesday night through the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a, a meaty book. It's a deep book. And over and over again, we see that theme. He says, look, you ought not be confident. You have no reason to be confident because you're babes in Christ again. Because those of you who are saved, there are some of you who are even deceived thinking that you're saved. But we need to be confident. And how can we be confident? We have a show so salvation. We're living for the Lord. We're serving Him. We're being faithful to Him each and every day. And we know we've had a time we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Speaking of how we expose false prophets. But guess what? The world is also looking on our outward appearance. Yeah. 2 Corinthians uh, 3, 2, I believe this, says, Ye are our epistles, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You're the only word of God some people will ever see. Do you have a show-so salvation? Well, Hannah, she was a virtuous woman, and she had a personal relationship with the Lord. But secondly, Hannah had her priorities right. Verse 11, it says that she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if that will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. You see, she had her priorities right. This was her desires. Now, she realized that children are a blessing of God. The fruit of the womb, the Bible says, is his reward. Matter of fact, uh, hold your place here. We'll be right back here. I want you to see just one other passage of Scripture. And this is the only place I think I'll have you turn. Turn to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Hannah realized, she had her priorities right. She realized children are a blessing, not a burden. Now there's times we get tired as parents. If we're truthful and honest, we do. We get tired, we get worn out. But you know what? Children are still a blessing from God. They're still a blessing. Hannah realized that today, across our country, because of the Supreme Court leak with uh, overturning of Roe v. Wade, there are uh, people who are pro-murder who are uh, protesting at churches in different cities across our land. And uh, I, I just thought, well, that's an easy fix for me. Uh, if we had anybody out here holding signs and wanting to protest and you know uh, say that you know we're not for women's rights and all this other stuff, and they were they were pro-murder and not pro-life then uh, what I would do is just send a couple guys over to get the speakers, hook it into our sound system, and uh, they can just listen to me preach. They want to stand there. There's an easy way to fix that because those women need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ as well. But today, babies are being put to death all across our land because there are selfish women who are seeking the world's wealth and gratification over the blessings of having a child. Now, that's hard hard for me to fathom. That's hard for me to understand that. But Psalm 127 verse 3, if you believe the word of God, you have to believe these verses. Verse 3 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. You know, we're all waiting for that rich uncle that's going to pass away and leave us millions, aren't we? But you know what? God is our father if we're saved. And it says that is our heritage. Children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his Reward. Skip down if you would in uh, Psalm 128. Look at verse number 3. It says, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. And we've got some fruitful vines here in the church. <laughs> Thank the Lord for it. 
Thy children are like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Now remember the virtuous woman back in Proverbs 31? A woman that what? Feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. What does it say here about a man that fears the Lord? It talks about his children and how he's going to be <coughs> blessed. And that's what God wants is to bless us. So Hannah had her priorities right. She was seeking God's blessings instead of the world's blessings. But back in 1 Samuel, there's something else. If we're going to have virtue, not only must we have a personal relationship with the Lord and, and have our priorities right. You know, are your priorities right in your life, your spiritual priorities? Are they uh, on top of everything else? Or do you have them messed up? I'm going to tell you, if you don't have your personal relationship settled with the Lord and you don't have your priorities right, well, you're probably not going to have this third thing either. Hannah was a woman of prayer. Amen. Prayer's got to be a priority. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be. And she was a woman of prayer. Verse 10 says she prayed unto the Lord. We find over and over again through this passage where she prayed unto the Lord. She cried out to the Lord. She did that. Many people don't get their prayers answered because their priorities, their priorities do not line up with God's priorities. Amen. Now, and I'm, I'm just saying this because I'm trying to help you. Who knows better than we do what we need in our life? God does. He created us. He knows exactly what's going to make us happy. He knows exactly what is going to fulfill us in life. So he gives us some God-given priorities. But if our priorities are different than his priorities, it could be a big reason why we're not getting our prayers answered like we want to. We need to make sure our priorities line up with God's priorities. Parents, when we think about prayer, parents uh, ought to pray for their children. Becky was reminding me, of uh, something uh, Brother Lee preached uh, a few years back. Uh, he was preaching about, you know, parents, and he said, made this statement. He said, if you aren't going to pray for your children, who is? Right. Yep. If you aren't going to pray for them, if you're not going to be burdened enough to pray for your own children, who else is going to be burdened enough to pray for them? We need to pray for our children. This is not just the mothers. This is the fathers. We need to pray for our children. And here's the thing. We ought to pray before they are even conceived. Amen. Even before they're conceived. Now, when they're in the womb, you, yes, you ought to pray for them. And when they come out of the womb, yes, you ought to pray for them. We don't know how many children God wants us to have, and, and we ought to you know, leave things into his hands because he knows. But we've always prayed this with our kids. And, and Becky's had six miscarriages over the years. Uh, we have six wonderful children. But we've always prayed and said, Lord, if they're not going to get saved, or if they're not going to live their life for you, we'd rather you take them in the womb than to be a reproach and a snare to other people. We'd rather do that. And I don't know if that was the case, if that was what was going to happen, but I do know this. Those different miscarriages that she had, God has used those in so many different ways for us to minister to other people. And we knew it was part of the will of God. Now, the wonderful thing is this. I know where they're at. Amen. They're in heaven. They're with Jesus. I'm going to see them one day. She's going to see them one day. And I believe with all my heart, we will know them when we see them. Amen. What a time of rejoicing that will be. But you know what? We pray for those young people even before we have them. We pray for all of our kids. And then, of course, here comes little Nehemiah at the end, a little surprise. We weren't <laughs> expecting that. But you know what? We pray for him just as much. And we need to continue to pray for each of our children. Just like each one of us need to do it. It needs to be a priority in our life. But let me say this about prayer. Instead of praying that your child be rich and successful, why don't you pray that they just serve the Lord? Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's a lot of noble callings, and I'm going to get ahead of myself here. I know this, but there's a lot of noble callings in life. God may want your child to be a preacher, a missionary. Those are wonderful things. They may want him to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a plumber, an electrician, uh, a manager at a store somewhere, or just a worker. Those are all noble things, and that's what God has called your child to do. But the greatest calling ever is just simply to serve the Lord. Amen. Yeah. That's what we ought to pray. Lord, wherever they can serve you, serve them. Just let them serve you. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, our oldest, she, is, she may be going to Africa with her husband here uh, next couple of years. Well, praise the Lord. That's great. You know, Timothy, maybe, who knows where he, he may be serving the Lord someday, you know, in the military or however God may use him and the other boys. You know, who knows how God's going to direct our children? 
But the Bible says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. What do you do with arrows? Do you keep them in the quiver? No, you pull them out and let them go. And however God wants to use the arrow is up to him. But we just need to pray for him. We need to ask the Lord to watch over him. There's been a lot of women of prayer in the Bible, women who have been barren, who have been women of prayer. I think of Sarah. Uh, she had Isaac when she was 90 years old. So some of you ladies, it's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't imagine that. Rachel prayed, and God gave her Joseph. Now you think about this. Isaac, Joseph, Ruth. The Bible says she was a virtuous woman. And she had Obed, who was the grandfather of David, King David. So we have Isaac, Joseph, and David. Elizabeth, she prayed, and she had a child. She was barren in her old age, and she had John the Baptist. Four men who changed the world because of the mother. We need to be praying. If we're going to be virtuous, a third or another thing we see here, if we're going to be virtuous, a fourth thing, Hannah was a woman of purpose, a woman of purpose. If we're going to be virtuous, we have to have purpose in our life. What is your purpose for being here? You know, the saddest thing I think is for a lot of people uh, in our society, they don't have a clue why they're here. Uh, we were down eating uh, at a restaurant, I think it's Cracker Barrel in Tennessee somewhere, and I remember talking to a, a young guy, and he was our waiter. He was so excited, and this was his conversation to us. He was so excited because he goes, I think I've discovered myself. <laughs> well, if you discovered yourself, you probably still don't know what your purpose is. <laughs> because you need to discover the Lord and let the Lord determine what your purpose is in life. And I tell you what, I had no clue what my purpose was until I started going to church. And I thought, Lord, there's got to be something more to this. There's got to be more than just us eating, drinking, sleeping, and being married because tomorrow we die. There's got to be something more to it. And then God showed me my purpose. And each one of us has a purpose. Each one of us are created special in the image of God. We all have unique gifts, talents, and abilities. And he wants us to come together in a church so we can use these things together to encourage one another and exhort one another, as the Bible says, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. We all need that encouragement. Hannah was a woman of purpose. If we're going to be virtuous people, we also have to be people of purpose. Look what it says here in verse 11. It says, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. What she was saying there is he's going to be a Nazarite. He's going to be a special person, a special person I'm giving to the Lord. She knew what her purpose was. All these years, she might have been confused what her purpose was, but now she has purpose, and she has given her man-child, Samuel, she has given him to the Lord. If our desire is to have godly children, and I hope that is your desire, is to have godly children, then we must have as our goal to be godly parents. That's right. They need an example to follow. Are we a good example or a bad example? We need to have purpose. We need to live our life with purpose. Nobody plans for their children to destroy their lives. How does that happen? Oftentimes it's because there was no purpose. There's no purpose. We need to make sure that we are a people of purpose. It's never too late to change that. We cannot make our children serve the Lord. But what we can do is teach and instruct them after we are the example before them. Don't live your life and say, well, do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't go very far with anybody, let alone a child, because they look right through that and they see the hypocrisy. Do as I say and do as I do. Follow me. That's what we ought to say as parents. It's just follow me. So Hannah was a woman of purpose, but also Hannah was a woman of persistence. Look at verse 12. It says, and it came to pass as she continued praying. She was persistent. She didn't give up. 
And don't ever give up on your child. Don't ever give up. And don't ever give up on this pursuit of being virtuous. Man, woman, child. We all need to be virtuous. We all need to add to our faith virtue. That's purity of heart, purity of life. We need to seek to be virtuous. Why? Because Jesus Christ was virtuous. And we need to be like him. But don't ever give up. And I'm thankful that we serve a God who's a merciful God. He's long-suffering. And if you feel like you failed and you feel like you stumbled and fall, I'm here to tell you, all I can say is just join the crowd because we're all there. There's not an exception to the rule. We all have failed and come short of the glory of God. But I'm thankful that God is merciful. He is long-suffering. He is there to help us and encourage us every step of the way. He is quick to forgive our transgressions. Amen. He is quick to do all those things. But don't take those things for granted. Don't use those as an excuse to continue to sin. But we need to be persistent. The Bible teaches us over and over again to wait on the Lord. But while you are waiting, we ought to still continue to serve Him. And we ought to still continue to pray. We ought to still continue to do the things that we know we need to be doing. And then lastly, we see in Hannah, here was a virtuous woman. How do we get this virtue? How do we achieve this virtue in our life? Well, first of all, it starts with a personal relationship with the Lord. Then we have to make sure our priorities are right. God, are these the priorities you want me to have in my life? Then we need to be a person of prayer. Then we need to be a person of purpose. And then we need to be persistent. But lastly, Hannah was a woman of persuasion. We need to be persuasive as well. That means we need to be a person of influence. Look at verse 21 of this chapter. She had tremendous influence over Samuel's life. Samuel was one of the godliest men in all of Israel as he grew to be uh, an old man. Verse 21, it is because of the influence of his mother. And the man Elkanah and all his house, that's her husband, went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him. Now, if you don't know what it means to be weaned, that was kind of like a, uh, a training period, but it was also where they would breastfeed the children. And this usually, oftentimes I've read different ages, but it could be up to two to five years old. Now, I've heard statistics before that a child, from the time they're born up to the time they're four years old, have formed... 50% of their personality. By the time they're eight, they have formed 85% of their personality and who they're going to be. Now you tell me, when is it important to get these young people in the church? When is it important to get the word of God into their heart and their life and let it become a norm? I'm thankful for Nehemiah. He doesn't know anything different other than going to church. There's nothing different he knows. That's all he knows. And that's all he's going to know. That's the norm. That's not the exception. She was persistent. She said, until he is weaned, and then I will bring him, and that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her. She kept her word with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. She's getting ready to give her child up. She's getting ready to let him go. And listen to what she says. Our young child, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let no, not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. You know what she's saying? God knew what he was doing. God knew what was best. She was a virtuous woman. She had virtue in her life. And if we're going to have virtue in our life, man, woman, or child, doesn't matter. We all need to have this virtue. If we're going to have this 
We need to start with our relationship with God. Do we have a show-so salvation? Now, if you have a show-so salvation, you can be confident you have a no-so salvation. But I hope you don't have a think-so salvation or just a say-so salvation, because if you do, you need to get it settled. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He died on the cross, shed his blood to pay for our sins. And you can have a home in heaven by putting your faith and trust in him. It's not in our good works. Our good works aren't good enough to get us there. It's in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But after that, there are some things he wants you to do. You don't have to get saved by faith plus works. That's not biblical. Because from the Old Testament to the New Testament, everyone's saved the same way. It's through faith. And it's all pointing to the blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no payment. There's no remission for sins. So if you've not been saved, we want to give you that opportunity. Because as I mentioned before, hell is hot. It is real. And it is eternity. Eternity is a long time. You don't get out. There's no halfway house. There's no, you know, I'm going to spend part time there. We're praying for death. There's none of that stuff. That's not found in the Bible. Once we die and take our last breath, we are going to live forever in heaven <coughs> or in hell. Amen. Based on that decision to accept Jesus Christ. Now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ your Savior, the next question is this. is Do you have virtue? Do you have purity of heart? Purity of thought? Purity of life? We need to have these things in our life, and it's something we need to continually work on in our life because God wants us to be a virtuous people. Let's all stay and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures, and I thank you for your blessings. I pray that you will bless this invitation time now as only you can. And help us, Lord, to be a virtuous people. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song here of invitation. And as we sing, if God spoke to your heart and uh, you'd like to come, and if I can get, uh, uh, Andrew, do you mind going over and tell Miss Beth that we're getting ready for the baptism here in Mrs. Evan. Thank you. Uh, but we're going to have a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. Won't you come? If you need to be saved, we'll have somebody show you from the open Bible. I'll be happy to meet you here at the altar. You just point me out, whatever. Get it taken care of. Don't delay. But whatever your need is, won't you come? What song? 249. 249, as we sing. thankful for them, thankful for their godly influence. And 
And I believe, Lord, even as uh, our children grow, Lord, I pray that you will help the young ladies to be virtuous women. And I pray, Lord, for the men, the young men, that they will be have virtue in their life. And, uh, Lord, we all need that. Father, we just ask you to bless now and give us a great day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can be seated.
This is Trenton. And Trenton, upon your public profession of Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I now baptize you, my brother, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. We have a tight fit up here. So. All right, this is Vance, his brother, and Vance, upon your public profession in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in his life. Savior. So, Caden, upon your public profession in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life.